And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. I am The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story. Attorney for the Defense. The trial had captured the headlines and commanded the bulk of page one news since its very first day. Randolph Abbott made news because he was dead, murdered, and his only daughter, lovely Ruth Abbott, was standing trial for his murder. Defending her was her father's own attorney, Joseph Herman. Now the court stood recessed, and Joseph Herman walked confidently from the crowded courtroom. Think you've got the DA on the run, Mr. Herman? Well, the district attorney has his job to do, and I have mine. But you may quote me as saying that Ruth Abbott is innocent, entirely innocent of her father's murder, and I propose to prove her innocence. Let's get to the point. A splendid statement, Joseph. Clear cut to the point. Your words will look good in print. But then... Your words are most important in this murder trial, aren't they, Joseph? More important than anyone else's. Because you're the only one who knows exactly what happened. The night Randolph Abbott was murdered. Yes, Joseph, you remember that night well. You called on Randolph Abbott for a very special reason. Oh, it's you, Joseph. Come in, come in. Good evening, Randolph. Oh, I hardly expected you to answer the door. Come on into the study. Medford's out this evening. All the servants are. Ruth's gone up to her room, probably didn't hear the bell. Well, sit down, Joseph, sit down. Now, this won't take long, Randolph. This is a business call. Business? Oh, yes, the payment on your note, I imagine. The last payment on my note, Randolph. Ten years. That's a long time, Randolph. I'm glad it's over, Joseph. I should think you would be. Glad? That's a small word for ten years of effort. Ten years of crawling to you with the payment, Randolph. I don't understand you, Joseph. You act as if I've done a villainous thing, saving you from prison, disbarment. The courts don't look kindly on embezzlement, Joseph. You should know that. You're a lawyer. Randolph Abbott's attorney, if you please. All right, Joseph. I've never asked for your gratitude. I don't expect it now. I'll get the note, and we can complete this unpleasantness. Uh, fine, fine. Get the note. Oh, and shall I hide my eyes, Randolph, while you work the combination to the wall safe? That won't be necessary, Joseph. The safe's merely closed. It's not locked. I was putting some things in when you rang. Here we are. Now, if you'll give me the money, Joseph, the note is yours. Okay. Here's the money. Thank you. And here's your note. Okay. Well, I... I guess I should thank you, too. That won't be necessary, Joseph. Oh, you don't want my thanks. You just want my money, is that it? No, Joseph, that's not it. If that's the way you feel toward me, I'm releasing you. You're at liberty to find employment elsewhere. You don't owe me a thing, Joseph. Oh, so this is the payoff. You kept me crawling to you for ten years for this? I've kept your career safe for you, Joseph. And by keeping you employed, helped you pay back the money that you stole. You seem to forget all that. I've given you another chance. Another chance. And then there's young Douglas, Drake Douglas. Ruth's fiancé, he's showing promise as assistant district attorney. In all probability, after their marriage, I'll turn my legal representations over to him. Oh, no, you won't, Randolph. I think you'd better leave now, Joseph. I'm not leaving, Randolph. Not yet. You said I didn't owe you anything. 
But you're wrong. Now, don't start threatening me, Joseph. I'll... You'll do nothing. You've done the last thing that you'll ever... Uh, no, Joseph, Here's... stop! Here's what I owe you, Wait. Randolph. The final payment. This! Since this is vacation time, I'd like to say a word tonight about an item that will have a lot to do with your driving pleasure. Gasoline. As you travel throughout the Pacific Coast states, you can continue to power your car with the famous Go Farther gasoline. Signal, that is. Yes, from Canada to Mexico, you'll see the familiar signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly, independent signal dealers. And when you gas up at a signal station, remember, mileage is only one of the benefits you enjoy. After all, the reason today's signal gasoline gives you such good mileage is that it helps your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you also notice quicker starting, proud pickup, and smooth, responsive power. That's why we say mileage and performance are like birds of a feather. They go together. So on your vacation trip or any time, remember you get all the things that make driving more fun when you get Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. Randolph Abbott lies dead at your feet, Joseph. Instinctively, you wipe your fingerprints from the heavy bookend from everything that you've touched. You move for the safe. You're certain Randolph kept the record of your payments there. Yes, you find them, neatly kept in a small record book. But there's something else in the safe, Joseph. You flip open the large leather case, and the light catches the brilliance of Randolph Abbott's collection of historical gems. You make a split-second decision. Robbery, Joseph. Yes, you'll make it look like robbery. Half an hour later, you carry your heavy, bulging briefcase into your own home. Your wife, Helen, sensing your urgency, follows you to your room. What's the matter with you, Joe? You paid Mr. Abbott, didn't you? You got the note all right. Yeah. Yes, I got the note. Helen. He's dead. Abbott's dead. I killed him. You killed him? I, I paid him. See, I got the note, and then he fired me. Just like that, he fired me. I, I, I couldn't help it. I... I must have hit him with a bookend. And all of a sudden, there he was. He's dead. Joe. But did anyone see you? Does anyone know you were there? No. No, no. The servants were gone. He said that Ruth was upstairs, but there wasn't a sound in the place after it happened. Oh, your fingerprints are probably all over the place. Oh, no. No, I wiped everything off. Oh, and just to be sure, I took these. I made it look like robbery, see? Opened a window in the study where we were. Well, what on earth are these? Jewels. Abbott's been collecting a few historical jewels. Oh, nothing much, but it was all I could think of to take. What do you mean, nothing much? They look genuine to me. Oh, maybe they are. He said that they were a hobby with him. You don't think he'd tell me about his jewel collection, do you? Wait a minute. What's in the separate case? Well, how would I know? I never saw it before. Oh, look at that, Joe. Huh? You think that necklace isn't worth a fortune? I don't know. That's stunning. Well, I'll say it's stunning. See, it's funny, too. I don't know why it should, but it it looks familiar to me somehow. Well, uh, see, uh, what are you doing? Looking through these magazines. One of them ran some color pictures of old jewels. I know that's where I saw that necklace. Oh, look, Helen, this is crazy. This necklace isn't important. We've got... Now, wait, the... wait a minute. Here it is. Huh? Oh, I knew I'd seen it. Look, Joe, a life-size color print. Here, I bet this necklace of Abbott's fits perfectly there. Oh, I'll be... Hey, what does it say there below the picture? Well, it says the Anne Boleyn necklace said to be the final gift of Henry VIII to Anne Boleyn before she was beheaded. It has in it all kinds of... Here, diamonds, sapphires, and emeralds. Oh, let's see. Good heavens. Well, what is it? Appraised by present-day gem experts at a value of $150,000. Think of it, Joe. It's worth $150,000. 
And we've got it. Well, Joseph, the brilliance and value of the Anne Boleyn necklace blinds both you and Helen for the moment. Until you remember that Randolph Abbott is dead, that you murdered him, Joseph. Still, you feel secure in the knowledge that no one knows you were with him tonight. And your wife, Helen, assures you that there's no reason for anyone to suspect you. That thought comforts you as you lock the Abbott jewels in your files and prepare to retire for the night when... Uh, hello. Uh, this... This is Ruth Abbott, Mr. Herman. Oh, yes, Ruth. My father... My father's been murdered. Murdered? Oh, no, Ruth. Oh, please, I... Mr. Herman. The police are here. I, I, I'm very tired. Can you come? Right away. Why, of course I can, Ruth. Of course. It looks as if I'll need an attorney, Mr. Herman. The police think that I... I killed him. They think you... I'll be waiting for you, Mr. Herman. Please, come quickly. Ruth Abbott? Yeah, the police are there. They think she killed her father. She wants me to defend her. You've got to do it. Do I? Why, Helen? Why not let Ruth take the rap? Don't you see, Helen? They don't suspect me. They suspect Ruth. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. N now, think a minute, Joe. You're Randolph Abbott's attorney. You've got to defend his daughter. You make a brilliant defense for her, Joe, because she's innocent, you know. No one knows that better than you do. I'm sure she's innocent, but I've got to think of myself. This is thinking of yourself, Joe. After your devoted, brilliant defense of an innocent girl, no one will ever be looking for you. And later, when it's all forgotten, we, we can sell the Anne Boleyn necklace and... Go anywhere and live comfortably. Yeah, maybe you're right, Helen. Yes, I think you are. Okay. I'll do it. I'll be the attorney for the defense. As you reach the Abbott home, you manage an expression of grave concern as Medford, the Abbott butler, ushers you into the study where Ruth Abbott and Police Lieutenant Simpson are waiting for you. Ruth stoically accepts your expressions of sympathy. And the lieutenant begins to fill you in on the uh, details of Randolph Abbott's murder. There aren't too many facts, Mr. Herman. I can give them to you quickly. Then you can talk with Miss Abbott here. Very well, Lieutenant. Mr. Abbott was killed earlier tonight at approximately 8.30. Huh. Between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. There was no one at home at the time except Miss Abbott. Are the servants? The servants had been dismissed for the evening, immediately after dinner. Before they left, the butler, Medford, and a maid overheard a violent quarrel which took place at dinner between Miss Abbott, her father, and Miss Abbott's fiancé, Drake Douglas. It was not a violent quarrel. It was merely a misunderstanding. Miss Abbott and the servants don't seem to agree on that, Mr. Herman. At any rate, at the height of the quarrel or misunderstanding, Mr. Douglas left. In anger, I understand. He was upset, that's all. Father disagreed with us about the date of our wedding, Drake's and mine. He wanted us to wait and have a large wedding. We wanted to get married right away, a small family wedding. And that's all we were discussing. Mr. Douglas went directly home. There are witnesses to testify. He was there the rest of the evening. When the servants left at 8 o'clock, Miss Abbott was alone here. She claimed she went to her room where she stayed until 11 o'clock. When she came down here, found her father. That's the truth. Oh, no, please, Ruth. Her fingerprints are on the bookend, Mr. Herman. That's the murder weapon. We also found the safe open. And her prints are on that, too. How many times do I have to tell you, Lieutenant? The bookend was lying beside father. I don't know why, but I picked it up. The safe was open. I just closed it. That's all. The safe, Lieutenant. Was anything taken from the safe? Miss Abbott says her father kept a jewel collection there. Historical jewels. They're missing, but that's all. Why, then, don't you think the motive could have been robbery and murder from the outside? The doors were all locked, Mr. Herman. One window in this study here was open. But there were no footprints outside the window. Now, Mr. Herman, this was an inside job. And we're holding Miss Abbott for the murder of her father. When the lieutenant leaves you alone with Ruth, you assure her you're convinced of her innocence. 
that even the web, even though the web of circumstantial evidence encircles her, you're sure that you'll find the wink link in the chain. The next morning, you go to your office to plan your defense for her. Late that afternoon, you receive a caller at your office. Well, Mr. Douglas, I am happy to see you. Thank you. Sit down. Uh, Mr. Herman, I'll come right to the point. I don't have very much respect for you as an attorney. So? I happen to know that you handled only small, routine things for Mr. Abbott for the past few years. Just why he apparently lost faith in you, I'm not sure. Mr. Douglas, do you think that perhaps your own desire to handle legal matters for Randolph Abbott has anything to do with your appraisal of me as an attorney? I'm sure it hasn't, Mr. Herman. And if I'm wrong about you, as I hope I am, I'll be the first to admit it. You see, if I were anything but assistant district attorney, I'd defend Ruth myself. Obviously, I'm not assisting the prosecution in any way. I've disqualified myself. Ruth wants you to defend her. She insists on it. Well, I'm glad to hear Mr. that. Mr. Herman, I'm very much in love with Ruth Abbott. She's innocent. That's a pretty good defense right there. And you had better build a good defense for her, or you'll answer to me. Drake Douglas's words echo through the next few days as you prepare Ruth Abbott's defense. There can be no slip-ups now, Joseph. Douglas is always around, isn't he? When you and the district attorney select the jury, through all the preliminaries to the trial, he's there watching you, weighing every word you say. And finally, the trial begins, and the district attorney is completing the opening statement of the prosecution. In summary, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prosecution will prove that the defendant, Ruth Abbott, had both a primary and secondary motive for murdering her father. The primary consideration was money, the vast Abbott wealth she was impatient to acquire. The defendant's secondary motive took hold after a violent quarrel when her father voiced disapproval of her approaching marriage. I have no doubt, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that much will be made by the defense of the fact that Randolph Abbott's collection of historical jewels were taken the night of his murder. But I say to you that these jewels represent a paltry sum in comparison with the wealth the defendant would inherit at her father's death. That these jewels were, in fact, expendable in the defendant's plan to make the murder of her father appear to be the work of a common thief, a housebreaker. You watch the jury for reaction, Joseph. Sense the temper of the crowded courtroom. Yes, the district attorney has made his points well. And he continues to build his case against Ruth with the testimony of the Abbott maid and Medford the butler. I distinctly heard them quarreling. Miss Ruth, Drake Douglas, and Mr. Abbott during dinner, uh, they were shouting at one another. And finally, I heard Miss Ruth say, I won't have it. I won't have it. You're not going to interfere with my wedding. Yes, sir, I would say it was an angry quarrel. Mr. Douglas left quite suddenly, and Miss Ruth saw him to the door. They seemed quite upset, emotional. Will you say they were angry with one another? Oh, no, sir. They were angry, extremely angry, with Mr. Abbott, sir. Well, Joseph, you need only see the expression on Helen's face when you go home that night to confirm what you already know. Things are not going well for Ruth Abbott. And that means they're not going well for you. But as you remind Helen... The DA's having his day, that's all. I'll get my crack at them tomorrow. Now, don't you worry about it. Well, I am worried, Joe. Have you forgotten what's at stake in this thing? Your own guilt and those jewels you've got locked in the file and that necklace, Joe. Well, of course I haven't forgotten. I... Uh, now what? Hello. Drake Douglas, Mr. Herman. Oh, yes, Douglas. I'll be blunt about it. I want to know what your plans are for Ruth's defense. Ruth is innocent. She's also the woman I love. And I warn you, whatever you do tomorrow, it had better be good. Yeah, well, for your information, Douglas, it will be good. 
I have an ace in the hole that'll blast the DA's theories to pieces. The next morning in court, you set the stage for playing your ace in the hole. You dwell on the close, happy association of Ruth Abbott and her father, on Randolph Abbott's sincere affection for Drake Douglas, his faith in him. Yes, Joseph, your defense of Ruth Abbott is building nicely. The angry quarrel of which the prosecution and its witnesses have made so much, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the defense shall prove to be merely a family squabble concerning the date and size of the defendant's wedding. Spirited, perhaps, but nonetheless the kind of lively discussion in which all families indulge. I dare say even my esteemed colleague, the district attorney, has raised his voice in such a minor disagreement with his own family. <laughs> but far more important and far more conclusively shall the defense rip through the single flimsy thread on which the prosecution hangs its full and highly vulnerable case against Ruth Abbott. They refer to the Abbott jewel collection as paltry in value and dismiss it with that. Why? Because it is far from paltry in value, and that is the one big flaw in their case, and they know it. Therefore, I shall call but one witness, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, one witness, the defendant, Miss Ruth Abbott. It's a dramatic moment, Joseph, and you play its drama to the hilt. Quietly, compassionately, you ask the first routine questions of Ruth. Each one a strategic step toward your main line of questioning, your ace in the hole. And finally, you begin to frame the all-important questions. Miss Abbott, are, uh, are you familiar with your father's collection of historical jewels? Oh, yes, of course I am. Hmm. Did you have free access to these jewels? Why, yes. Father frequently discussed them with me. In fact, at his insistence, I, I, I wore them many times. I see. Now, Miss Abbott, according to the transcript, the prosecution refers to these jewels as paltry in value. Do you know their actual worth? Well, I, I know that a diamond brooch which once belonged to the Royal House of the Netherlands was insured for $20,000. A ring of emeralds and diamonds from an ancient Oriental dynasty was appraised at $10,000. A 15th century ruby pendant was valued at $15,000. And the Anne Boleyn necklace, Miss Abbott. What value did it have? Why, I... I, I, I don't know its value. Well, would you say the entire collection would be worth enough that not only a common thief, but a big-time, highly expert jewel thief might consider it more than paltry? I object. Objection sustained. All right. I'll reframe the question. Would you say the entire collection was worth $200,000? Well, yes, I, I would think that's the approximate value. <laughs> you let the full impact of Ruth's words sink in. Then you turn and face the prosecution quickly huddled together. The value of the jewels, the real possibility of theft by a jewel expert, has dealt their case a telling blow, Joseph. You're certain of that. You're even more certain when the district attorney arises and addresses the court. Your Honor, the prosecution requests a recess of two hours for purposes of reviewing the recent testimony. Unless the defense has objections, the court is recessed until two o'clock. The defense has no objections, Your Honor. No objections at all. Now, I'm going to predict a sight you're going to see oftener and oftener as the days grow warmer. Overheated cars parked at the side of the road to let their steaming radiators cool off. To make sure this annoying occurrence doesn't mar your summer driving fun, signal service stations have three little items to rejuvenate your cooling system. The first is radiator cleaner to remove clogging scales, sludge, and rust. The second is rust preventive to protect radiators of old cars or new ones from further corrosion. And the third is radiator sealer that stops small leaks in a jiffy. 
These, incidentally, are just three items from your signal dealer's complete line of recognized quality accessories that include Lee tires, Champion spark plugs, Rainmaster windshield wiper blades, and Purolator oil filters. So when you see the familiar signal circle sign in yellow and black, remember, there you'll find not only the famous Go Farther gasoline and signal premium compounded motor oil, but also a complete line of fine accessories and services to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. Yes, the trial had captured the headlines and commanded the bulk of page one news since its very first day. Randolph Abbott was dead, murdered, and his only daughter Ruth was standing trial for his murder. Defending her was her father's own attorney, Joseph Herman. And now, after spending the two-hour recess lunching with his wife at a nearby restaurant, Joseph Herman has returned, and the judge has declared the court to be in session again. Are the attorneys ready to resume the case? We are, Your Honor. Uh, and will the defense resume questioning, please? The defense has no further questions, Your Honor. Your Honor... Mr. District Attorney? Your Honor, in view of the evidence which has quite recently come to the prosecution's attention, I move for dismissal of the case against Ruth Abbott. Oh, Order! Order in the court! On what grounds does the prosecution move for dismissal? Your Honor, facts have come to my knowledge from the very record of the trial, based on testimony, on record in these proceedings, which are sufficient to dismiss the case against the defendant. In light of this, I would like the Assistant District Attorney, Mr. Drake Douglas, to tell the court what he told me. It's in regard to the Abbott Jewel collection, Your Honor. Only three people could have known about one piece in particular. The defendant, Ruth Abbott, will swear that on the night her father was murdered, he showed her the historic jewel he had acquired only that afternoon. At that time, he requested that she tell no one about it. Ruth told no one until she told me a few moments ago during recess. The only other person who could possibly know about the jewel is the person who killed Mr. Abbott and stole the jewels. That person has revealed himself, Your Honor. Just before the court recessed, the attorney for the defense, Mr. Joseph Herman, specifically questioned Miss Abbott about the jewel, the Anne Boleyn necklace, during direct examination. No, no, he told me about that necklace, Your Honor. An order in the court, Your Honor. After Mr. Herman's question this morning, the prosecution obtained a search warrant. And during the recess, while Mr. Herman was lunching downtown, we went to his home and found the Abbott Jewel collection in his files. We submit them now in evidence. Your Honor, the state requests that you order the arrest of the attorney for the defense, Mr. Joseph Herman, for the murder of Randolph Abbott. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Many drivers, when buying gasoline, forget what a big part of the price goes for tax. In fact, every time a driver in the average western city buys a dollar's worth of gasoline, tax adds 33 cents to his bill. In other words, the tax you pay on three would give you a fourth gallon free. Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, Ben Wright, Sarah Selby, Don Oreck, and Gene Bates. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen with story by Stephen Abbey, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>